Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and you've probably seen the video talking about how Netcode for Game Objects is finally fully released. It's one of the best performing videos, so people are definitely interested in multiplayer. I'm still hard at work on the full tutorial, hopefully it won't be out by either next Monday or Wednesday. There were tons of interesting questions in that video, so here let me answer a bunch of them. Starting off right away with a question from Algor Deus, who asks, what exactly is the limitation for small scale games? I wasn't sure about this myself, there are no details on the documentation, so I asked around on the forums and the answer that I got appears to be related to bandwidth. The system is designed to synchronize all the data in a single packet when a player first joins, so at a certain point with enough network objects that data packet becomes so massive that apparently causes a timeout when sending that packet. If this is where the only limitation comes from, then it seems like it should also be possible to fix it. Basically, it just needs to split bigger packets into smaller ones, so instead of sending the entire game state all at once, send it over multiple packets. Perhaps this is something they will now tackle now that the system has reached 1.0. And also, this limitation sounds like something that you could handle yourself if you absolutely need to. You can create network variables, remote procedure calls, and basically decide for yourself what data you want to synchronize, so you don't have to depend just on the built-in components. Then there were a bunch of people asking for comparisons with Photon, Mirror, or Fishnet. Personally, I do not have experience with any of those, so I really cannot tell you what are the pros and cons and which tool is best. I have heard great things about pretty much all of those tools, and using Netcode for Game Objects by myself, I also think this tool is quite powerful, so I really cannot tell you which tool to pick. They all seem pretty great, so in most cases, just pick one and learn, unless your game has some very strict requirements. Like, for example, you require extreme accuracy for a super highly competitive game with tons of players. In that case, definitely spend some time studying all of the options, all of the pros and cons. Then Justice asks about visual scripting, and since visual scripting works on reflection, it can work just fine with pretty much any c -sharp class. The only limitation is that visual scripting does not work with generics, which are used pretty heavily in netcode for game objects. So making it purely with visual scripting would be quite tricky, but it is certainly possible to make your logic mainly with visual scripting and only use c -sharp for some of those connecting parts. Always remember, you don't have to go full visual scripting or full c -sharp, you can mix both of them. Then Zim asks about Dots Multiplayer, or Netcode for Entities. Like I mentioned in the current state of Dots video, it's currently still in development and it's targeting for a full release by next year. Netcode for Entities will be the tool that is meant for more complex multiplayer games, so things with tons of units, tons of networking logic, so I do want to cover that, but I'm going to wait until at least Entities 1.0 preview is out, so perhaps only around December. Then Arthur asks, how about a nice addition to my TBS course, adding some multiplayer, either versus or co-op? And yep, that would indeed be an excellent idea. I'm currently hard at work on making a free expansion to the course, implementing hex grints, but after that is done, I definitely would like to experiment with adding some multiplayer. It would also be a fun challenge to see just how difficult it is to add multiplayer to a game after it's been done rather than right from the start. That's usually something that you're not supposed to do. If you want to make something multiplayer, you definitely should do that from the start. But since the code in that course is very well written, I think it could be an interesting challenge and hopefully it's actually doable and not very difficult. Also, plenty of comments on the videos mentioned the complete course on multiplayer. As usual, my problem is always the same, lack of time. There are way too many topics that I'd love to cover, but not enough time to do them all. But perhaps I might be able to do something on a smaller scale, so maybe about 5 hours instead of a massive 10 or 20 hour course. So enough time to be a good course with quite a lot more information than I can do over here on YouTube, but not so much that it requires 6 months to build like my TBS course. I still have some big projects that I need to finish first, but perhaps I can find the time to do something like that. I always enjoy making courses because it allows me to dive deep into one project and I definitely would like to explore multiplayer in quite a bit more detail. So hopefully, perhaps a full multiplayer course sometime near the end this year. Then one very important question that Tom and some others asked is about pricing. With regards to netcode for game objects, the tool itself has no cost, neither does Unity Transport, so by itself it is completely free. The question depends on what service you want to use to host your service. Technically, you could make it completely for free. The system works on peer-to-peer, -peer, so you can have the player input a direct IP of the host and then have the host set up port forwarding. With that approach, it would indeed be completely free, but asking your players to do that is not really a good idea. Asking the player to handle IPs and port forwarding is something that will definitely annoy your players nowadays. So to fix that, Unity has two services. You have Relay, which is peer-to-peer -peer but simplifies the process so you don't need to handle IPs or port forwarding. And then Unity also has Multiplayer, which is for dedicated servers. The cost for those services is on the Unity Gaming Services pricing page. You can see down here that Relay is free for up to 50 concurrent users. So for an indie game, that's actually quite a huge amount. 
And then for the bandwidth, that is going to depend on how much data you're synchronizing. If you go above the limits, then it's 16 cents per additional concurrent user. So that seems like a pretty reasonable cost. Then down here for multiplay, for this one, since it's a dedicated server, the cost is on a per hour basis. And as soon as you create an account, you have an $800 credit. I also asked Unity about this credit, and this one is for your whole account, not on a per project basis. So at a quick glance, both these prices seem pretty reasonable. If you're an indie dev, then the relay free tier, this one is likely more than enough. But also I should point out that you are not required to use Unity Gaming Services. You can use any relay service you want or any dedicated service you want. For example, I covered Azure in a recent video. You could use that to run your dedicated service. Although again, I'm not sure on the math, so I'm not entirely sure on which approach would be cheaper. Then a bunch of people asked if this is server or client authoritative. The answer to that is really up to you. You can make it server only or server and client. By default, most of the things are server authoritative, meaning that by default, when you make a network transform, only the server can move that transform. The client does not have the permissions to move it, but you can also use a different component that does let the client move itself and tell the server its own position. Now, as to which approach is best, it really depends on the kind of game you're making. If you're making a casual co-op game, kind of like Overcooked, then security isn't that big of a concern. So in that case, I would say it's probably fine to trust the client. But if you're making something much more competitive and PvP, then in that case, you definitely should not trust the client. So the system supports both. It's up to you to decide which one to use. Then Alex asks about rollback netcode. This is a topic that I've only briefly heard about. It's especially important in super fast games like fighting games, which is a genre that I don't really play much. But upon doing some quick research, it does look quite interesting. Basically, when the player presses a button, you play the action instantly. Then on the other player, when they get that packet, you jump the opponent animation forward so it matches when the other player hit their input. So it requires a bit of work, but it's certainly doable. This is a very niche topic, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover it, but I definitely want to research it for myself. Then Point and Shoot Video asks if between netcode for game objects and netcode for entities, if between those two it is possible to make any game, and the answer does appear to be yes. So netcode for game objects is great for small scale games, and netcode for entities should be great for everything else. So hyper competitive games with tons of tracked objects, it should be great for that use case. Over here, Captain Noyox asks if it integrates well with existing solutions like Steam, and the answer is yep, it does work. They mention it on docs, you can easily swap out the underlying transport layer. So instead of using Unity transport, you can use the Steam transport and everything on the game objects layer should work just fine. Then Law then asks how about adding it to current projects. And for that, the recommendation is always that if you're going to make your game multiplayer, definitely do it from the start. Adding it after the game is done can be possible or it can be pretty much impossible. It really depends heavily on the quality and the complexity of your code. Perhaps you just need to rewrite a few things to make it work, or perhaps you need to rewrite so much that you pretty much end up building the entire game again from scratch. Then Wasif asks about creating a metaverse with hundreds of players. Now for that use case, this is really not the right tool for it. If you absolutely need 100 players, then you should look into something else like Photon Fusion, which is what they use to make the Battle Royale 200 player game. Then Game Dev Demon Pawi asks if this is a good solution for a two player card game, which is peer to peer. And the answer is yep, absolutely. This is exactly one of the use cases where this system is perfect for a small scale multiplayer game, especially for a card game which is turn based and you don't need lots of prediction or any kind of lag compensation. So this is definitely the perfect use case for this tool set. Then here Costello asks what about an RTS? And for this genre it really depends on the scale. If it's an RTS with a handful of units then yep, it is possible. But if you're looking to make something on the scale of Supreme Commander with tons of units on screen, at that scale, I think it might cause some issues. But again, also depends on how you implement it. The limitation is apparently on the bandwidth, so if you are smart with how little data you send, then perhaps even a large RTS can be done. I would recommend that for these edge cases, you build a quick prototype pushing your design to the limit, just to see if it works. Then, yeah, that guy asks about combining Mirror with Unity Transport. Now, I'm not familiar with Mirror, but Unity Transport is designed to be modular. So if Mirror also supports a modular transport layer, then yep, that seems like it could work. Matthew asks about how to share data amongst users in a mobile app. And for that use case, it really depends on how often you're sharing that data. If it's in real time, then yep, a multiplayer tool like this one is indeed great. However, if it's for sharing data, but not in runtime, so something more asynchronous, for that, a better tool would perhaps be something like Azure, which I covered in a recent video. 
you can store some data in the cloud and get the players to request that, which is perfect for any asynchronous multiplayer or just some simple messages. Yifeng asks if it can be self-hosted, and yep, you can create a server build and host it wherever you want. Like I said, it does not have to be using Unity Gaming Services or Multiplay. The server build is just an executable, so it can be run anywhere. And if you're using a player host, then it can also run anywhere. CodeFox asks about using this for making a survival game, and again, it's only a question of scale, but survival games usually don't involve hundreds of players, usually just a few players and a few networked objects. So yeah, for this genre, I would say it does seem possible. And over here, Heat asks about peer-to-peer, -peer, and the answer is it can be peer-to-peer, -peer, either on your own or through Unity Relay, and it can also be based on dedicated servers. Again, either host on your own or through Multiplay or through any other cloud provider. All right, so those are a bunch of your interesting multiplayer questions and my answers to those. It always helps me to learn more things when I get asked a question that I might not have thought about. It causes me to research some topics and learn some more things. And then the more things that I learn, the better I can teach. So thank you all for asking all these questions. Like I mentioned, I'm currently hard at work on the full tutorial. So far, I'm quite impressed with how this system works. It's pretty easy to use and it's pretty powerful. I definitely think this will be a huge help for anyone wanting to make multiplayer games. So stay tuned for the full video tutorial, either on Monday or Wednesday. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.